Our journey takes us to the Black Sea coast in the Krasnodar Krai region of Russia. Dolmens are a topic of much debate. Some people think they were used as ancient burial sites, but recently, scientists have uncovered an even more puzzling find. They discovered dolmens that weren't built by stacking stones, but were carved from one huge rock. This happened at a time when such advanced technology was believed to be impossible. Does this discovery help us understand the real purpose of dolmens, or does it just make the mystery even bigger? Join us as we unravel the secret behind the giant prehistoric dolmens in the Caucasus built with advanced technology. Introduction to Volkonsky Dolmen the Volkonsky Dolmen is a large, ancient stone monument situated just 200 meters from Novarez's Sochi Highway, near the village of Valkonka, in the Lazarevsky district. This site attracts not just tourists, but also historians, people interested in esoteric practices, and those fascinated by the occult. The term dolmen comes from the Breton language and means stone table. Dolmens are typically described as large stone structures with flat, tabletop-like slabs supported by upright stones. They are commonly known as ancient burial or ceremonial sites. What makes the Volkonsky Dolmen particularly intriguing is that it's the only monolithic dolmen known to exist today. It was carved out of rock to form a small hall-like chamber. Officially, it's dated to be about 4,000 to 5,000 years old. However, there are theories suggesting it could be even older. Remarkably, there are signs nearby that suggest ancient drilling tools might have been used in its construction. This implies that the dolmen were not simply made with primitive tools like a stone axe. The dolmen measures approximately 16 meters long and 8 meters wide, and the inner chamber is 1.5 meters high. Its facade features a neat rectangular shape with a round hole in the center. Inside, there is a chamber with a small hole and a notch on the floor. Despite all the speculation and research, the exact purpose of the dolmen and the identity of its builders remain a mystery. It's unlikely we will ever uncover the full story behind this ancient monument. The dolmen structure, made of sandstone, is thought to be thousands of years old. Many experts believe it might have appeared on Earth around the same time as the Egyptian pyramids, Though opinions on this vary because of differing theories about when the pyramids were built, some researchers suggest that the dolmen could be an ancient burial site or tomb. Another interesting theory is that it might be an acoustic device placed in unusual locations where the Earth's crust is fractured. According to this idea, its purpose could be to warn people about upcoming disasters. Some people believe that giant creatures make low-frequency humming sounds that humans can't hear. Right before an earthquake, the pitch of this humming changes, and in the city of Sochi, people start to hear this hum. Locals have various stories about the magical properties of the dolmen and the nearby plies, a type of ancient stone structure. They say that if you make a heartfelt wish at the dolmen, it will come true if it's a kind wish. Tourists often get nervous because they notice strange things happening with clocks and other measuring devices near the dolmen. Sometimes clocks start running backward or stop completely, and instruments stop working. According to old legends, these dolmens were used for divination, and special rounded stones found inside were part of this practice. These stones were thrown to see how they landed, which was believed to reveal insights. This likely refers to the depressions found on the flat surfaces of the rocks, although similar depressions can also be found on vertical surfaces. On the roofs of dolmens, you often find both individual depressions and groups that form patterns or designs. Some scientists think that these drawings might be a map of the night sky made by very old civilizations. Near the drawings, there's a small funnel by a hole and the floor of the room. We can only guess what it was used for. The area is named after Princess Valkonska, who spent a lot of time there. Some people believe this site is about 9,500 years old, which is amazing because it shows that people back then had the knowledge and skill to carve hard rocks into such precise shapes. Other scholars think this place might have been a temple where people meditated. Nearby, there's a natural spring, and in the greater Sochi area, many other similar structures exist, but most of them are just old slabs of stone. In addition, there are trough-like formations that have been carved out of a single large rock. 
the ceiling of these formations is a separate slab of stone. However, it's very rare to find large, monolithic spaces carved from one piece of rock. The Volkonsky Dolmen is considered unique, not just in its region, but in the entire world. Unfortunately, two similar structures were destroyed in the 20th century. Dolmens in the Caucasus Throughout the Caucasus Mountains, including Abkhazia, many ancient stone structures like megaliths, dolmens, and stone labyrinths have been discovered, dating from the end of the 4th millennium to the start of the 2nd millennium BC. These fascinating sites, though not extensively studied, are scattered across a vast region, most of these structures are rectangular and built from large stone slabs or carved directly into rock, often with distinctive holes in their facades. They spread across the Western Caucasus, covering an area of about 12,000 square kilometers in both Russia and Abkhazia. The dolmens of the Caucasus are especially notable for their unique prehistoric architecture. They were constructed using large, precisely cut stone blocks. Some stones were shaped into sharp 90-degree angles for corners, while others were curved to form circles, showcasing the advanced skills of their builders. Although these structures are not well known outside the Caucasus region, they are as old and architecturally impressive as the famous megaliths found throughout Eurasia. Their origins remain a mystery. Despite the diversity of monuments in the Caucasus, they share many features with megaliths from various places across Eurasia, including the Iberian Peninsula, Italy, France, Great Britain, Ireland, the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Iran, and India. Many theories have been suggested to explain these similarities and the practice of building megaliths in general, but the reasons are still not fully understood. There are around 3,000 large stone structures known as dolmens in the Western Caucasus, though new ones are frequently discovered and some are being lost. Many of these ancient structures are now in poor condition and could be completely lost if they aren't safeguarded from damage and neglect. The North Caucasus dolmens seem like a hidden city near the Black Sea. These dolmens might have once held valuable metal objects or jewelry that were stolen by the Scythians around the first millennium BC. They might have also had spiritual importance and are starting to be valued once more today. The dolmens come in a few basic shapes, square, trapezoidal, rectangular, and round. Most of them have a doorway in the center of their front. Round doorways are the most common, but square ones are also found. In front of each dolmen, there's usually an open space that spreads out, possibly used for ceremonies. This area is often surrounded by high stone walls, sometimes more than a meter tall. Archaeologists have discovered bronze and Iron Age pottery, along with human remains bronze tools, and ornaments made of silver, gold, and semi-precious stones in these spaces, which helps date the sites. The decorations on these ancient stone structures are pretty simple. You mostly see patterns like zigzags, triangles hanging down, and circles within circles. One common design is a shape that looks like a horizontal beam supported by two upright stones seen at the top of the stone slabs. Some dolmens also have relief carvings of pairs of breasts which are usually placed above these column-like decorations. Another related feature is the stone plugs used to block the openings of these structures, and these often have a phallic shape. Some of the more unusual items found with dolmens include large round stone balls, pairs of balls, and animal carvings. A particularly fascinating sight is a group of three dolmens arranged in a line on a hill overlooking the Zhena River near Galenjik in Russia, along the Black Sea coast. This area is rich with various megalithic sites, including both settlement areas and dolmen cemeteries. The two main monuments are surrounded by large stone mounds. The central dolmen is shaped like a rectangle, measuring 4 by 4 meters. In contrast, the two smaller dolmens on either side are round, with diameters of 4 and 5 meters. The round dolmens were bulldozed, likely in the 1950s, to clear the area for tree cutting. However, the main part of the central dolmen remained intact and undamaged. Nearby, there is a fourth dolmen close to the Jane River. This dolmen has a hidden entrance at the back of its chamber, along with a decorative facade, a fake entrance, and a small courtyard at the front. Besides these well-preserved dolmens, some are in ruins. 
the Caucasus dolmens are linked to the Klin-Yar community and the Koban culture. A 2020 genetic study of samples from these communities, including the Koban culture, discovered a paternal haplogroup DZ27276. This haplogroup is found in modern Tibetan people. Other haplogroups identified were haplogroup J1 and haplogroup GM285. In addition to these, other significant megalithic sites have been discovered along Russia's northern coasts, including the shores of the White Sea and the Barents Sea, as well as on Vera Island. Black Sea Deluge Hypothesis The Black Sea Deluge is a theory that suggests a huge increase in the Black Sea's water level happened around 5600 BC. This rise might have been caused by water from the Mediterranean Sea breaking through a barrier in the Bosporus Strait. The idea gained attention when the New York Times featured it in December 1996, just before it appeared in an academic journal. While experts agree that something did indeed happen, there's still debate over how suddenly it occurred, the exact timing, and the scale of the event. Two main theories attempt to explain the rise of the Black Sea. The gradual theory. This suggests that over the past 30,000 years, water has flowed back and forth between the Black Sea and the Aegean Sea in small amounts, without any major sudden flooding events. The Flood Theory This proposes that a massive flood, or deluge, suddenly increased the water level in the Black Sea, drastically changing its size and landscape. Both theories aim to explain the same historical phenomenon, but suggest different scenarios and timelines for how the Black Sea's water levels changed. In 1997, William Ryan and Walter Pittman shared their finding that around 5,600 BC, the Black Sea experienced a massive flood through the Bosporus Strait. Before this event, melting glaciers had turned the Black and Caspian Seas into large freshwater lakes. These lakes used to flow into the Aegean Sea. However, as the glaciers melted further, some of the rivers flowing into the Black Sea shrank and changed direction, flowing into the North Sea instead. The lake's levels dropped due to evaporation, and global changes in water levels caused the sea level to rise overall. Eventually, the rising Mediterranean Sea overflowed over a rocky ledge at the Bosporus. This overflow flooded an area of 155,000 square kilometers and greatly expanded the Black Sea's shoreline to the north and west. According to the researchers, about 40 cubic kilometers of water flowed through the Bosporus every day during this event, 200 times the flow of Niagara Falls. The Bosporus was at full flood for at least three days. Between 1998 and 2005, a series of sediment sampling trips in the Black Sea, led by French oceanographer Gilles Larry Calais as part of a European project, supported Ryan and Pittman's findings. Additionally, the NOAA project led by Petko Dimitra from the Bulgarian Institute of Oceanology provided further proof to confirm their theory. Mark Siddall's calculations suggested the existence of an underwater canyon, which was later confirmed to be real. However, there is debate among geologists about the details of the event. Some agree that the sequence of events did happen, but they argue about how quickly and dramatically it occurred. If the Black Sea's water level had been higher initially, the impact of the spillover might have been less intense. Many geologists also doubt that the Aegean Sea could have maintained enough pressure over a long period to carve through a supposed land bridge at the Bosporus, or that the difference in water levels between the two seas was significant enough. This challenges the theory proposed by Ryan and Pittman. Additionally, data from Ukrainian and Russian scientists, including Valentinian Kohosh, suggests that the water flow through the Bosporus has changed direction multiple times throughout geological history, depending on fluctuations in the Aegean sea levels. In the Black Sea, new research questions the earlier idea that a huge break at the Bosphorus sill caused massive flooding. The water levels predicted by researcher Yanko were very different from those suggested by Ryan and Pittman in 2007. Recently, a detailed study was published that includes earlier Russian research in English for the first time and combines it with new scientific findings. This research came from a five-year project funded by UNESCO and the International Union of Geological Sciences, which ran from 2005 to 2009. A February 2009 article from this project suggested that the flooding might not have been as severe as previously thought. 
According to a study by GeoCell, before the Black Sea connected with the Mediterranean, its water level was about 30 meters below the current level, which is much less extreme than the theories suggesting a catastrophic event. If there was a flood, the rise in sea level during this reconnection was much smaller than previously estimated. It turns out that the event happened earlier than we first thought, around 7,400 BC, instead of the originally suggested 5,600 BC. This is because the Bosporus Strait today has a depth that ranges from 36 to 124 meters, with an average of 60 meters. If we calculate the shoreline of the Black Sea from the Stone Age, when it was about 30 meters lower than it is now, it suggests that the Black Sea might have always been connected to the Mediterranean during the Holocene period. This means there might not have been a sudden, dramatic flood like a waterfall. A recent study, which looked at changes in a type of tiny marine organism called dinoflagellate cysts, found no proof of a catastrophic flood. This also ties into various flood myths, like Noah's Ark and ancient Mediterranean floods that happened around 5.33 million years ago. Many geologists still doubt that water from the Aegean Sea could have created enough pressure over a long period to cut through the Bosphorus Strait, or that there was a significant difference in water levels between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean in the past. In 2007, a book was published that brought together earlier Russian research on this topic, making it available in English for the first time and mixing it with newer scientific findings. A 2009 study by Liviu Giosin, Florin Philippe, and Stefan Konstantinescu found that before the Black Sea connected with the Mediterranean, its level was about 30 meters lower than it is today, not 80 meters or more, as some theories suggested. This means that if there was a flood, it was much smaller than previously thought. Given the current depth of the Bosphorus, ranging from 36 to 124 meters, a 30 meter lower Black Sea shoreline suggests that the Black Sea might not have been cut off from the Mediterranean during the Holocene, and a dramatic, waterfall-like flood probably didn't happen. The flooding, if it occurred, may have been quite modest. In 2011, researchers found no underwater evidence of catastrophic flooding that submerged prehistoric Black Sea settlements during the late Pleistocene or early Holocene periods. A 2012 study on a type of microscopic algae showed no signs of a sudden, catastrophic flood. Instead, evidence from various scientific methods indicates a gradual submersion over a period of 10 to 200 years. A review in 2022 concluded that there was not enough evidence to support a flood theory. It is more likely that the Black Sea's waters slowly flowed into the Mediterranean. Additionally, there was no archaeological proof of people evacuating the region during this time. The Giant Rings here at the Giant's Ring, located just south of Belfast, in a small town on the edge of the city, you'll find a fascinating historical site. This place is remarkable because it features a dolmen, an ancient stone structure, and a large henge with five gaps in its main bank. It's quite similar to Stonehenge and Avebury in England, though no one knows exactly what it was used for. It could have been a ceremonial site or even a settlement for the early inhabitants of the area but the purpose remains a mystery. What makes the giant's ring particularly intriguing is that it dates back to around 2700 BC, which is quite ancient for this region. It's one of the largest henges in all of Ireland, not just Northern Ireland. As the sun begins to set, we're capturing some aerial footage with a drone to give you a bird's eye view of the site. The dolmen is slightly off center, adding an interesting geometric element to the overall layout. The site spans over 600 feet in width, with the dolmen's off-center position contributing to its unique design. As you enter the giant's ring, it feels like stepping into a massive bowl, and there's no evidence that it was used for defense. The arrangement of the banks and ditches suggests it wasn't meant for protection. At the center of the site is the sacred burial place marked by the dolmen. Archaeologists have discovered Neolithic remains here, indicating that a very important individual was buried in this location. The presence of the dolmen, along with other finds, highlights the significance of the site. Its vast bank and ancient atmosphere make it feel both monumental and mysterious. Let's get a closer look at the dolmen as we explore this incredible historical location. This structure is a classic dolmen, a type of ancient tomb found in various parts of the world. 
It's supported by several large stones, with a huge capstone on top that likely weighs around 10 tons. The capstone is slightly tilted now, but it's still quite fascinating. It's made of basalt, although other dolmens are made from different materials. What makes this dolmen especially interesting is that it's situated within a ring, which is unusual. It's relatively small compared to other dolmens, but some of the stones are massive, each weighing over 10 tons. You can even sneak inside the dolmen, and you might notice that some parts have been worn smooth over time, possibly from people sitting on them. The way the capstone rests on the other stones might suggest a piezoelectric effect, a phenomenon found at many similar sites due to the crystalline nature of the rocks. Inside the dolmen, you can see where a barrier once stood, which adds to the structure's complexity. It's a bit risky to explore as you never know if the structure might be unstable. The dolmen also has an interesting feature. Sunlight shines through a specific area, which could be related to astronomical events like Beltane, an ancient festival marking the start of summer. This adds another layer of intrigue to this ancient site. It seems like there might have been a shadow cast here that extended into the circle, possibly making it act like a calendar or a dolmen. However, it might have served a completely different purpose. Curiously, this feature is located right in the center of what appears to be a sacred area in the giant's ring amphitheater. Standing here, you will be struck by how incredible this place is. You can see how the capstone touches one when they are not there, and you can also see the other stones in the dolmen. The sun is setting in the distance, adding to the atmosphere. Dolmens like this can be found all over the world, from Jordan and Korea to North America, such as in North Salem, and even in Colombia. It's truly fascinating how these structures appear in so many different places. Mysteries of Dutch Dolmens Drenthe is a province of incredible natural beauty, featuring dunes, forests, heathlands, charming villages, and ancient monuments. It is located in the northeastern part of the Netherlands and is home to nearly all of the country's dolmens. Within a 30-kilometer area, you can find 52 of these ancient stone structures scattered across the landscape. These dolmens are about 5,400 years old and are the granite remains of megalithic monuments that were built long before famous sites like Skara Bray, Lof Crew, Brincelli Du, Wayland Smithy, and possibly even Newgrange. Drenthe holds 52 of the 54 dolmens still found in the Netherlands, with the remaining two located in the neighboring province of Groningen. We will focus on two of these Dutch megalithic structures, known as D53 and D54. Unlike their counterparts in Britain and Ireland, Dutch dolmens don't have the same intriguing names. Instead, they are simply labeled with a D for Drenthe or a G for Groningen. Before diving into the details of these dolmens, it's important to understand how the landscape came to be and who built these impressive structures. It's quite surprising to find such massive stones weighing up to 20 tons each in a flat and sandy country like the Netherlands. The region known as the Honsrug in Drenthe and Groningen is home to 54 of these ancient passage graves, with Havelterberg being a notable part of this area. The Honsrug is a long, low ridge that stretches from Groningen in the north to Emmen in the south. It was formed during a past ice age called the Penultimate Glacial Period, which started about 194,000 years ago and ended around 135,000 years ago. During this ice age, the ice sheets in this region temporarily stopped moving. As a result, huge boulders from Scandinavia were carried here by slow-moving glaciers and left scattered along the Hans Rug. Beneath these ice sheets, a layer of boulder clay, also known as ground moraine, formed. This boulder clay, which is between one and three meters thick, became the base of what we now call the Drents Boulder Clay Plateau. In addition to the boulder clay, the melting ice also left behind deposits of meltwater. Some of these deposits were absorbed back into the boulder clay, but in other areas, you can still see them today. During the last glacial period, the landscape around the Hans Rug underwent dramatic changes. Much of what we see in the landscape today dates back to this time, especially from the end of the last ice age. One major event during this period was the deposition of cover sand. 
the harsh conditions made it almost impossible for plants to grow. The Netherlands turned into an open tundra, with arctic winds blowing freely across the land because there was no vegetation to block them. This caused thick layers of sand to spread over large areas of the Netherlands, covering the land like a blanket. This is why we call these layers cover sand. In the Havelterberg area, the covered sand didn't settle as evenly as it did elsewhere. This could be because the landscape or the movement of the ice was different, or there might have been less sand available. As a result, dunes and ridges formed in this area. These uneven landforms are exactly what drew prehistoric settlers to the region. Hendrik Vorman, an amateur archaeologist who lived near the Havelterberg, made some fascinating discoveries in the 1930s. Among them was a camp used by reindeer hunters around 12,000 BCE. Despite our best efforts, we couldn't find more details about this camp after searching for several hours. Now that we understand how the landscape was shaped, we can focus on the builders of the dolmens. The Swifterbant culture was a group of people in the Netherlands who lived from around 5,300 BCE to 3,400 BCE. This culture is called sub-Neolithic because while they were influenced by the farming methods of the Neolithic people, they continued their traditional ways of hunting and gathering. They did adopt some Neolithic practices, like making pottery. The dolmens, large stone tombs in the Netherlands, come from a group known as the Western Funnel Beaker Culture, which descended from the Swifterbant people. These dolmens were built between 3,400 and 2,850 BCE in the area stretching from what is now Amsterdam to Hamburg. The stones used for these dolmens are called glacial erratics, which means they were carried by glaciers and dropped in place. The dolmens we see today are just the remains of what they originally were, as many of their mounds have been destroyed over time. In the Netherlands, these dolmens are called Hunabedden, which translates to giant's beds. At one point, there were between 80 and 100 of these dolmens in the Netherlands. Today, 76 sites are known, 53 are still in good shape, one is badly damaged, and 18 were destroyed during the Middle Ages. Dolmen D53 is the second largest dolmen in the Netherlands. It was constructed between 3400 BCE and 3100 BCE. This dolmen is 18.1 meter long and 4.4 meters wide. It has 21 supporting stones, two end stones, and nine capstones. The dolmen is oriented east to west, with the chamber facing west. Its porch faces south and is still complete with two supporting stones and one capstone. The site is surrounded by a large oval stone circle, which was originally the base of a mound. Builders placed 26 stones around the mound to support it, but only 10 of these stones are still there today. D54, located just a short distance from D53, is a bit smaller. It measures 12.7 meters long and 3.3 meters wide. D54 has 14 support stones, AX capstones, and three end stones still in place. Like D53, it is also aligned east to west. Sadly, D54 has never been studied or excavated scientifically. In the past, Dutch dolmens like D53 and D54 were covered by earth to form mounds. Over time, these mounds were damaged or destroyed by people using the earth for farming by natural forces or by treasure hunters. D53 was first noted in 1732 by Andries Schoenmaker, and a sketch of it was made by topographical artist Cornelis Pronk in 1737. French maps from 1811 referred to these dolmens as ancient Hunic burial sites covered with large granite stones. D53 was scientifically researched in 1918 by Professor Albert van Giffen who also numbered the dolmens in the Netherlands. During the study, researchers found that some capstones had shifted from their original positions, but were put back as they had been for thousands of years. They discovered over 600 pieces of pottery, three flint axes, an arrowhead, and four beads, including one made of amber. They also found cremated remains of at least five people and several animals, including two bear claws, the burial chamber floor was made of flat boulders covered with burnt granite grit, and the passage floor was made of regular boulders. Traces of 16 missing curbstones were found, marking the original base of the mound. In Dutch folklore, 
there are spirits known as Vita Vivan, or white women, believed to be wise female herbalists and healers with prophetic powers. These spirits were thought to linger around sacred places like burial sites. People believed that mist on a grave meant the Vita Vivan were present, so they would leave offerings and seek help. During the Middle Ages, megalithic structures like these were significant in the religion of Germanic tribes that had not yet converted to Christianity. As a result, many dolmens were damaged or destroyed. Stones were drilled, filled with gunpowder, and exploded or broken with wedges to be used in road construction or church buildings. This led to the loss and destruction of many dolmens and cairns, and their history was forgotten. In 1734, Drentha passed a law making it illegal to destroy these monuments, with a fine of 100 gulden for any damage or stone theft. Despite this, many stones and at least seven dolmens still disappeared. Interest in dolmens grew in the 19th century, and efforts to protect them increased. In 1809, investigations were banned except for the Hofstad brothers, who had royal permission to study the dolmens. During World War II, the Germans ordered the demolition of D-53 to build an airstrip. Professor von Giffen negotiated with the German Air Force to prevent the destruction of D-53's stones, which were buried in a seven-meter deep pit. D-54 was also covered with sand to keep it hidden from the Allied forces. The floor of D-53 was left intact, and after the airstrip was heavily bombed between 1944 and 1945, the dolmen was rebuilt in 1949 based on earlier research and drawings. By 1950, D-53 was restored to its former glory. Unfortunately, archaeological evidence from the airstrip area was lost as the Germans dug deep and destroyed all layers of the ground. Recent soil investigations confirmed this loss. In 1988, the remains of five mammoths were discovered near Havelterberg, showing that these creatures lived during the last ice age. The bones had carvings likely made by Neanderthals. What are your thoughts on the giant prehistoric dolmens in the Caucasus built with advanced technology? Share your thoughts with us in the comments section.